when I show the picture of my four grandchildren, I tell the world, Hitler lost and I won. That's the secret. In 1928, you're born in Germany. During the midst of the Holocaust, you lived in, in an orphanage. Right, in Switzerland. You moved... Otherwise, I wouldn't be alive. Then Palestine, and be careful, Rebecca. I was a sniper in the underground, in the Haganah, in 1948. I've never killed anybody, so you can continue asking your questions. But I was badly wounded on both legs. That's not why I'm short. I would have been short anyway. Then I lived in France for five years, went to the Sorbonne, studied psychology, and came to this country, to this great country, in 1956 on a visit, with a visitor's visa. I'm now an American, so don't worry. And uh, they made me be Dr. Ruth, and I love it. <laughs> what attracted you to becoming Dr. Ruth? I never would have dreamt that I would be Dr. Ruth. When I came to this country, I realized I could get a scholarship for a master's. So I went to the New School for Social Research in New York and got a master's in sociology. And then I went to Columbia University, Teachers College, where I'm teaching now, and got a doctorate. And I worked for Planned Parenthood of New York City. And I thought this is really something very important uh, to help educate people of all ages about sexuality. I then was very fortunate. I got accepted at Cornell Medical School. I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, with a program by Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan. And this way, I, this I became a sex therapist. Daniel is nervous with women. Then I did a radio what program. What did people think when you very first became a sex therapist? Nobody talked so openly about issues of sexuality, but I was very well trained. I was very fortunate because I had the uh, academic training to be a sex educator, and I had now the training to be a sex therapist. So the combination was wonderful. But the most important thing is my accent, because when people opened the radio Sunday nights, they knew it was me. And uh, so I did that for 10 years. Uh, when I came to this country, they told me that I have to take speech lessons. I didn't have money for speech lessons. I made a dollar an hour. I love the idea that the thing that could have made you weaker, that could have kept you from accomplishing what you have accomplished, is actually one of the things that propelled you to accomplish such That's greatness. True. It's the accent, it's the height. And I just did a book, a brand new book. You've Not got over 35 books now. Right, but I did one book now for children. And it's called Leopold. And it's about turtles. A turtle, if it stays in one place, it is safe. Nothing can happen. It carries its home on its back. I didn't have a home on my, uh, to, to, to go into since the age of 10. So I'm very interested in that. If that turtle wants to move, and you know that as a reporter, you have to take a risk and you have to stick your neck out. You could get hurt, but without sticking your neck out, you, you don't move. So it's true that I also have the strong conviction since I survived and one million and a half Jewish children did not survive the Holocaust. I have an obligation to do something to repair this world. I didn't know that that was talking about sex from morning to night, <laughs> but I am very happy that it turned out this way. So when it comes to the person who's afraid to stick their neck out, to be the turtle that moves around the earth, what's your advice? My advice is you have to take the risk. If you get hurt, mourn for one day and then go on and try again. How do you get over it? What do you recommend for people who are mourning for more than one day? You know this exists. Of course. People feel trapped. They feel I, like they don't know how to move forward. What do you recommend? I do recommend sometimes to go to see a therapist. Put those things on the table that you don't talk about with your friends, that you don't talk about in your family, uh, you know, with your family. Put those things on the table and see if the therapist 
can shed some light. Why are you uh, stuck in a particular relationship uh, in my area of competence? Or uh, in work, why are you stuck? What else could you do? What is the worst advice you've received? The, the, it wasn't really advice, but the worst thing that I can think of is that I thought I'm short, I thought I'm ugly, I would never get married, and I was married three times, but the last marriage was the real marriage, almost 40 years. So one should not uh, listen to those thoughts, oh my gosh, what's going to become of me? But to be like the turtle, stick your neck out and go forward. What's your best piece of advice to everyone out there to be their very best self? To take some time, look in the mirror, look at those features of your body that you like. For example, in my case, don't look in the mirror and say, I'm so short. Look in the mirror and say, look how fortunate, age 88 and I'll talk. I'm talking to Rebecca. I love that. <laughs> how, do you, how do you stay so active at age 88? What are you doing? First, first of all, I'm very fortunate I'm healthy. And I'm also a little careful. I let them pick me up in a car. <laughs> I let them bring me where I have to go. I'm just very fortunate that I love what I'm doing. And I'm very fortunate I have a daughter, a son. I have four grandchildren. I have a daughter-in-law I get along, I have a son-in-law that I get along, and uh, four grandchildren. When I show the picture of my four grandchildren, I tell the world, Hitler lost and I won. That's the secret.